My name is Barry Rave. I'm a professor here at the Ford School and director of Close Up, the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy. We're very pleased to be partnering today with the Ford School to offer this policy talk on the issue of Michigan fiscal policy, looking back and also looking to the future. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors for uh, sharing in today's event, helping us promote the Center on Finance, Law, and Policy, the Office of Tax Policy Research. We will be taking uh, questions from the audience at the conclusion of the talk. Beginning around 4.35 or 4.40, we will begin questioning, as we often do here, question cards. So you, you have cards in front of you. Give some thought to those, and we will be collecting them. My colleague Stephanie Leiser and some of her students from her graduate course in public budgeting uh, will be reviewing these and uh, managing the Q&A process. And for those of you who are joining us online, watching online today, you're invited to post your questions via Twitter using the hashtag policy talks. It is always an interesting time in this state to think about the fiscal condition. This is a state that has known good times and bad times over the last half century and beyond. And what an interesting decade we have been through. What an interesting period of time the Snyder years have been in the fiscal condition in the state of Michigan. And with that, we begin to think about inevitable transition with elections to come this November, changes in leadership, and all of the rest. And so we are especially delighted today to welcome, actually to welcome back, Nick Curry to the University of Michigan campus. Mr. Curry was appointed by Governor Snyder in April of 2015 as the, 40, for the 46th state treasurer by Governor Snyder with responsibilities in the Treasury office that really span a wide set of responsibilities linked to the collection, the dispersal, the investment of all state monies, putting him in really a unique position to think about these past years and the fiscal life of this state and the years and issues and experiences going forward. Prior to his current service, Mr. Curry served elsewhere in government and also in the private sector, held a number of posts at DTE Energy in Detroit, including Senior Vice President for Corporate Affairs. Prior to that, he worked in the public sector, previously serving as Chief Deputy State Treasurer, Chief Economist with the Senate Fiscal Agency at the federal level at the Congressional Budget Office. He holds a graduate degree in economics from Michigan State University, but we're particularly delighted to welcome him back as an alum, mindful of his bachelor's degree in economics from U of M. It is my great pleasure to introduce the 46th Treasurer of the State of Michigan, Nick Curry. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I do try and do this uh, as often as I can just because I enjoy it so much. But what I enjoy most about it is hearing what you have to say, uh, both your questions and your comments and your criticisms and your compliments, too. I know it's more interesting for you. <laughs> you get, I get fewer and fewer of the latter. But I know it's more interesting for you, but it's definitely more interesting for me. So I'm going to talk a little bit at you. I thought this was a college class, so I had to put together slides, which I usually don't do. Uh, and I'm going to go through a few slides, but you know, as you're thinking, I want to spend more and more time talking about what's on your mind, and I'll tell you what's on mine. Uh, I guess just a little bit about me. Uh, I have um, done state and local policy for a long time. I also spent half my career in the, in the private sector, too. But I do have the honor of working in uh, Treasury at Michigan and, and working for the legislature in Michigan 20 years ago stepped outside of Lansing and then came back 20 years ago, or came back just a few years ago to finish my career. So I do have a perspective on how things have changed in Lansing. Be happy to talk about that. Uh, you know, I think the shorthanded answer, oh, by the way, I do digress sometimes. So if I'm digressing like this, just give me one of these. Uh, but you know, some things have really changed in the last 20 years and some things haven't changed in the dynamics of Lansing and, and fiscal policy. You know, so the thing that hasn't changed is the fundamental questions we ask all the time every day. What's the appropriate size of government? What's the appropriate uh, allocation of resources? You know, government is defined as so many things in our life as unlimited desires, unlimited needs, and limited resources. So this endless debate we have about what's the best 
what's the appropriate size of government, where should we be spending our money, and just you know, where I spend a lot of my time is what's the best way to raise that money, what's the appropriate tax structure. Uh, and so those issues continue to debate, just like uh, I stepped in a time machine and went back 20 years ago. There are other issues that, uh, they are the same, but they're different terminology. And I'm talking a little bit about, you know, one of the responsibilities of an appropriate tax system is evolve with a change in economy. Those debates are still happening. You know, 20 years ago is what do we do about lawyers and doctors. These days it's what do we do about the virtual economy and how do we continue to evolve once we define what it is. And then there's a whole, uh, I wasn't going to go this long on this issue, but, and then there's this whole issue of things that the dynamics have changed. Part of it is term limits in Michigan. That wasn't here then, it is now. It has changed the dynamics of the discussions. But, but that isn't what I'm here to talk about today. What I'm going to talk about today, I decided, is uh, not dive very deeply into anything, but I'll be happy to talk about something in more depth. I decided to spend a few minutes just giving a broad overview of where the state economy is right now and then put it in some perspective. What's that mean for the state budget? both on the expenditure revenue side. Talk a little bit about local governments because I've been spending a lot of time in local governments in Michigan and their fiscal health. And then end with some of the things everybody's talking about in Lansing. Uh, you know, I do feel a little inhibited because there's a lot of people in this audience, like my friends, economists from RSQE, that know a lot about these topics more than I do. Uh, but then I fund their budget, so you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, I think they're gonna agree with most of what I say. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But there are many people in this room that know about some of these specific topics much more than I do. And I hope during the question and answer period or the complaint period, we get into some of the details. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. Is that okay? Yeah. That okay? That okay? Okay. You know, I, and I did say, you know, I do this maybe once a semester or two. And my internal ratio is the, uh, the ratio of people who fall, students who fall asleep versus stay awake. <laughs> and so my target is 80%. So if I can hit 80% today, I'm doing well. Uh, let me go through some of the slides just to, just to kind of make it interesting. The first one is just uh, talk about Treasury. And the only reason I bring this up is because I'm willing to talk about anything you talk about. This is all the stuff Treasury does. We advise the governor and the legislature, when they listen, the legislature on state and local tax policy broadly. We're responsible for providing the administration's forecast to the budget. Uh, we're responsible for collection administration of all state taxes, about $24 billion. You can measure it different ways, but uh, uh, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about but we collect a lot of taxes, and that's a big part of the job. Uh, we are a big, uh, along with all the other stuff, we're a big production shop. You know, we do 5 million individual income tax returns a year. We do 350,000 business taxes every quarter. So a lot of my time is talking about operational issues, not policy issues. I'm the sole fiduciary for a $70 billion pension plan, which is scary. Uh, we, we are responsible for the monitoring, the assistance, the intervening with local government and schools uh, financially. You know, I don't talk about economic or um, educational performance, but we're responsible for the fiscal health at the end of the day. Uh, we help students if you get a MET or MSBP, we do that. Uh, the overall relationship with uh, Wall Street issuing debt, you know, we don't issue equity, obviously, we're a com uh, government. but. Uh, managing the day-to-day -day cash flow, uh, managing long-term borrowing for the state. Uh, again, the only reason I mention that is during the question and answer period, when I run out of things to say, we can talk about any one of those areas. It just doesn't have to be state and local tax policy. But let me, let me just talk a little bit about the state economy really quickly. These are, as you know, uh, the best of all day uh, worlds almost, uh, nine years out of the recession trough. The state's um, labor force is, is improved dramatically, both absolute and relative terms you see during the, the bad days. I'm going to get to the half empty. This is the half full. You know, clearly uh, the state's labor market has improved both absolutely and relative to the rest of the nation. You can see the U.S. at the bottom, but you know, we <coughs> tapped out at almost 15 percent during the recession. We're down to four and a half percent now, more or less. And so not only in absolute terms, but in relative terms, uh, we've had a tremendous improvement in our labor market. Uh, and this follows, I'm going to talk a little bit about it, this follows the lost decade that everybody talks about, that in Michigan, uh, I'm sorry if this is a Michigan-specific uh, discussion, but that's what I do for a living. If you're interested in other states, we can talk about that, because many of these themes are common throughout the industrial, Midwest at least. Uh, but this, uh, we'll get into other things, but 
uh, in Michigan, we had a reduction in employment almost every year for 10 years, I think. You, know, you guys can tell me, but I think that's unprecedented. It is for Michigan, I assume for any other state. We've had sharper recessions but this long, drawn-out restructuring of losing employment every year for a decade is, I think, unprecedented. It certainly felt unprecedented. So we've come out of the trough uh, doing gang, go gang busters, certainly. And so we're actually at the point now where the debate is, is very little about, uh, about uh, labor demand. You know, people are, where are the jobs? And it's now about more labor supply. It's more about training and talent. And we'll talk about that at the end. But it's a real focus now, everybody. So these jobs are available now, at least during this part of the cycle. How do we get the employees trained and ready to take the jobs that are available right now? And so th that in itself is an indication of where we are in the cycle and hopefully how we've improved since the last decade, that people are talking about filling the jobs that are available, not there aren't any jobs available. Uh, this is personal, I, we don't need to get into this, just this measure of the wealth of at least one measure of per capita personal income, wealth of the state. We've had a dramatic run compared to the rest of the nation, a stronger run from the recession bottom. 2017, depending on the time period, we were number one, one quarter, number 10. So we've had a great run since the tr uh, recession's bottom, either in the labor force or in income. We've also had this diversity. People have talked about years for years about diversification of our employment base. Uh, this chart I love, it's, you know, it's just a summary, but we've had this shift away from manufacturing uh, over the last 10 or 15 years. It wasn't so much voluntary, it was a restructuring of the auto industry, but certainly you see the fall off in employment in manufacturing, you see it's 18.9%, 14.1%. Uh, manufacturing was the number one sector in Michigan forever. It's now number five. Manufacturing is the number five employment sector in Michigan. Uh, and so it's, it's rotated out, and it's rotated out to these other sectors. Uh, it's not just retail. It's professional business services, healthcare services. They're paid relatively high. Uh, you can see, you know, average wage, I think this is 15. No, the average wage is 17. You can see we're rotating into the sectors that are relatively high wage. So hopefully it's going to do two things. One, increase, continue to increase the standard of living overall, but hopefully give us some protection during the next recession. We'll talk about that. Now, so, some of this is from productivity within the manufacturing sector in the U.S., but also in the state of Michigan. Uh, a couple of tidbits I always love. Since the recession bottom, tell me if I'm wrong, since the recession bottom, production in the auto industry in Michigan is up, it's up, up 100%. Employment's up 20%. So you can see the productivity improvements within manufacturing. Another tidbit I always love, and I'm going to read it to you. So this is from McKenzie, so who knows if it's right. But in 1990, <laughs> in 1990, the big three, 250 of revenues, 250 billion of revenues, uh, 36 billion market cap, 1.2 million employees, the, in, the big three in 1990. Fast forward to 19, 2014, it's a little old, but 2014, the big three, the silicon companies, the big three high-tech companies in 2014, they had 247 billion of market cap. I'm sorry, 247 billion of revenue, it's about the 250 of autos. They had a trillion dollars of market cap, they had 137,000 employees. About the same revenues, about the same importance, if you look at the Dow now, you know, it's dominated by the high-tech, 1.2 million employees back in 1990, and now it's 137,000 employees in high tech. So it's part of this productivity or restructuring that we've seen in Michigan over the last few years. Uh, so that's the good news. We've had a great run from the recession bottom. Uh, if you take a broader view, including this lost decade, we are a smaller state. Uh, here you just see the change in employment, we lost about 800,000 jobs. In the recession, we've gained about 500,000 jobs back, so we've gained about 60%. And also the change in labor force during the recession, during the lost decade, not the recession. We lost 300,000 jobs, we've gained only 84,000 jobs left. So we've had a great cyclical run. We've, we're, we're not back to where we were prior to the lost decade. And that, um, the labor force, of course, we talk all about demographics, discourage workers, but, but the, the point I want to make is that we've had this, nothing new, we've had this relative shift, downward shift, 
in the Michigan economy. Uh, it's nothing new. You know, you look back the 40s and 50s, we were 10 percent above the national average here per capita. We kind of took a shift down during the 70s. You know, you don't remember, but I do during the 70s and the Japanese invasion. And we took another shift down in the 80s, 2000, when we had a, a severe recession in the early 80s. And now, again, we've just taken another shift down. And now we're 10 percent below the nation. So although we've had a great cyclical bounce, We've had this deterioration relative to the rest of the nation and the size and wealth, relative wealth of our state. And the reason that's important, because now we're done with economics, how was that? Was that okay? That, this, is, this shows one measure of state government, $32 billion. There's, you know, we spend about $56 billion in Lansing each year. About $20 billion is federal dollars that flow through transportation and Medicaid. We raise about $32 billion. Uh, and you can see here by this measure, it's essentially been flat since 2000. In nominal terms, real terms obviously, it's gone, gone down. You know, the old cliche is true, you, you don't get the government you deserve, you get the government you can afford. And so we've had to painfully, slowly adjust our budget and our fiscal policy towards this changing relative deterioration in the economy. So, a big part of that, you know, part of it is policy induced. People are deciding what's the appropriate size of government, but also part of that flat line on the top is just a response to the, the change in economy over the last uh, 10 to 20 years. Another way to measure it, so this is, you know, another way to measure it is our general fund, which has, we have the most discretion over. You know, this includes all dedicated revenues, not federal revenues, but dedicated revenues. The general fund's been $10 billion since 2000. So in nominal terms, it's been flat. So let's talk a little bit about revenues. Again, I want to get to question and answer period. Let's just give you a snapshot that, you know, of the um, 36, here we measure 38. Again, we included some miscellaneous. 38 billion, we really at state are dependent on three taxes. They represent 85% of our taxes. You know, our income tax raises is about nine, uh, eight, $9.8 billion. Our sales and use tax raises over almost $10 billion. And then the property tax raises about 14 billion. Uh, transportation, you know, transportation, we raise some dollars. That's, uh, that's mostly federal match, but we raise two and a half billion dollars locally in transportation, and then we match it with federal dollars to to leverage that. And then everything else is all other. Uh, within that, all other is corporate income taxes, too. And uh, so corporate income taxes, we have a corporate income tax now, raises about a billion dollars a year. Uh, we also, you know, non-C corporations, pass-through corporations, you know, with the LLCs, all those, they probably pay another couple billion dollars a year that shows up in the personal income tax. Offsetting that, we give about 700 million in credits this year uh, for things we think are good. You know, you create jobs and you get a credit. The batteries were my favorite. Film was probably my favorite. We always have this debate about what was the dumbest credit we've ever done. And it's always a competition between batteries and, um, and the film credit. But anyway, it, that number was a billion dollars a couple years ago, so it's gone down. So within that, all, all other is, about $700 million of tax credits. Um, now, we've got to be a little careful of that because, you know, one of the rules, one of the etiquettes of policymaking that people don't always honor is you've got to be careful judging what policymakers did when you weren't there because a lot of these things were done in the, in the pressure of a recession in the lost decade. So people were making decisions that you look back and say, well, that was dumb, but you don't know the pressures they were under then. But certainly some of the credits that were given away we're still haunted by, and we're going we're to be haunted by from a fiscal perspective for a decade. Um, now, now, part of this, uh, this just shows that our relative tax burden has declined, measured here in the since 2010, but there has been a decline in our relative tax burden. Now, here, this becomes part of um, policy decisions of people were made on the appropriate size of government. That's, and that's, what hap that's what's happened here. We've gone from 18th highest to 30th highest. And now, except, except for the property tax, we're out of the top 20 in most, in most of our major taxes. Uh, so let me just talk about 
not so much a rainy day fund. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it now because uh, part of what we're focusing on now is avoiding what we call, what I call the yo-yo effect of fiscal policy, right? Times are good, you cut taxes, you increase spending. Times are bad, you respond by increasing taxes and cutting spending. What we're trying to do is think more over a longer time period, which is how to sell fiscal policy, both spending and tax policy, with a thought to the next five years at least, at least not the next 12 months. And so we are talking about, well, what have, at least, you know, not elected people so much, but policymakers are talking about how do we get prepared for the next recession? Because the next recession obviously will come. Who knows when it will be? So we're talking a lot about, you know, how do we deal with long-term liabilities so we get a chance to uh, attack those now? How do we set aside uh, reserves? How do we make sure the budget is fundamentally balanced now? Because it's easy to balance the budget on paper. It's much, much harder to really balance the budget. You, it doesn't take long to realize how you can balance the budget on paper and fundamentally, uh, structurally not be balanced. You know, you pull ahead revenues or you, you push expenditures out, you tap reserves. So really we need to take this opportunity now with the wind at our back to get prepared and think about what happens uh, during the next downturn. And so again, we've attacked long-term liabilities, we put aside money into the rainy day fund, we're almost a billion now, won't last long, but, uh, but it's at least a, uh, gives us breathing room when the next recession hits. But you know, you always got to be careful here. It's like, uh, it's like planning for the next hurricane. You can do all the planning you want, or it's like, you know, what, Tyson said about boxing, you do all the planning of what you want until you get punched. Uh, and then you don't really know because each recession is different. I've been through, we've, we've been through a lot, but I've been to too many of them now. You never know when they're going to happen. Uh, now I do feel bad. Our ability to forecast the macro economy is limited past a few months. You never know when it's going to happen, and when it happens, it hits harder than you think. Revenues drop faster than you think, and expenditures increase faster than you think. It's just a, I've been through there. I've walked through a recession of governors say, you've got to bring revenues down by 200 million. You go in the next month, it's another 200 million. And they go in the next month, he says, when are you going to stop? I don't want to see you anymore. So you can't absolutely plan for it and, and kind of insulate the, the budget from the next recession, but you at least need to think about it and get prepared as much as you can. Uh, okay, I'm going to talk about local government. Are you guys okay? You guys, uh, it's okay? Do you need a break? Okay, I'm going to talk about local government in Michigan mostly, just because that's what I'm interested in. Uh, and mo you know, we have this disaggregated structure in Michigan. Most state, many states don't. We have 1,800 local units of government. Uh, not only townships and counties, a lot of people don't have townships, but all, you know, we got all these special authorities, we've got transportation districts, so we have 1,800 local units of government. Uh, and we talk about the fiscal health of local governments, the answer is it depends. You know, it really does vary by geography, by size, by function. It's not just urban areas, some of our uh, fiscally uh, the districts that are struggling the most are up in the UP. There's not a lot of people there, but relative to the population, there's many areas in the UP that are struggling even more than some of our urban areas. So it's not an urban rural split, but, uh, but it is in pockets throughout the state. You know, the local governments really are dominated. You know, t you know tax policy you learn in, I learned from Harvey Brazier, who most of you don't know, but uh, you know, the usual uh, efficiency and, and, and fairness and horizontal equity. And um, there's also simplicity, which is really important, but diversity. And local governments in Michigan fail the diversity test. They are heavily reliant on the property tax. They, you know, um, so this is total property tax. Local governments generally, it's about $12 billion of property tax, $1.2 billion of revenue sharing, which we can talk about, they always complain about. Uh, 500 million of local income tax, you know, there's 20 cities that all that love it, and then 500 mis of miscellaneous. So local governments are heavily dependent on a single revenue source. Uh, and that revenue source has particular constraints to it, constitutional and statutory constraints. It doesn't respond real well to the changing economy for a variety of reasons we can talk about. Uh, so while governments are doing Local governments generally are doing well. You know, we got four and a half percent unemployment, 
we got, we're selling 17 million units. It's covering up a lot of problems. You know, the old Warren Buffett, you don't know who's swimming naked until the tide goes out. I'm very concerned when the economy slows. Many, many problems financially at the local governments are going to surface. And the worst time to try and solve a problem like this is during the crisis. The old cliche is today's problems are yesterday's solutions. Absolutely happens in fiscal policy, uh, not at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level. During a crisis, you make these decisions because you're in a crisis that come back to haunt you. Now is the time to get our arms around this. I'll talk about what the, I don't have a solution, but I'll talk about the framework of the solution in a minute. Uh, this is revenue sharing. I just put this in because they always complain about revenue sharing. Revenue sharing has taken this wild ride over the last decade from you know, way high, one and a half billion, down to 900, uh, 900 million, really, and then back up. So it, it has been whipsawed local units of government, uh, their second leading revenue source. Another issue that's really hitting some local governments, not all, but some is this unfunded liability on pension and health care. It is at the state level. It is at many states' level. I mean, look at Illinois. Compared to Illinois, we're doing great compared to Chicago. But we've got to come to grips with this at the local level. The, you know, I know there's, uh, there's this question of justice and what and retirees need and deserve. That's not what I'm talking about, although it is what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the unfunded liabilities continue to grow and their ability to service that is not growing at the same pace. For some local units, their obligations for pensioners, health care, and retirees is eating up 20% of their budget and growing. So other areas that they should be spending money on continue to decline because it's pushed out by this rising obligation. Some of it is demographics. You know, obviously the labor force is getting old. Some of the urban areas, you know, Flint, for example, has five retirees for every active worker. Some of it is being driven by health care costs. Health care costs are going up depending on how you measure it, 6 or 7 percent compared to a couple percent inflation. Some of it is, is being driven by market returns because you put a bunch of money aside and you hope the investment earnings offset inflation. And the way it works is when you have a couple of bad years, it takes a while. So part of it is market returns. And part of it is we just did, we collectively made bad decisions. We thought good times would last forever, so we gave benefits. That we get 13th check is my favorite, which is, you know, whenever you had excess money, you gave it to people. The problem with that is the way you run a pension plan is you need the good years to offset the bad years because you're going to have bad years. If you give away the good year all the time, you don't have any cushion for the bad years. But, you know, again, it wasn't anything, well, it, you know, it, it was mistakes made at the time because it seemed like the good days would go on forever, and in fact, they're not. So we're talking with local units of government now about what do we do about this? You know, we're trying to be a little agnostic as to how you do it, but there's not a lot of options here, right? You put more money into the fund, you put more money away, you cut benefits, you raise taxes. You know, there's nothing else. There's no real magic. So we're being a little agnostic about what they should do. That's a local decision. But clearly they've got to come to grips with this. They have an obligation to the people they're making promises to be able to fulfill those promises into the future while not destroying the rest of local government. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, but. I'm running out of things to talk about. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk. Uh, I didn't know I was supposed to talk to about an hour. I never talk for an hour. I, I didn't know that until I came in. Uh, so I'm stretching it out as long as I can. <laughs> Let me talk a little bit about uh, looking forward. I've got a couple slides. First, just talk you know, how we see the world, mostly because we're still in RSQE's view of the world. But we see continued expansion over the next couple of years, which is going to be critical because most of our budget decisions now, we're trying to get ready for a recession, but the base forecast is continued expansion. One of the things I wanted to point out is our, this is the general fund, you know, the, the money we have that has most flexibility is $10 billion a year. It's not dedicated to anything. It's not formally dedicated to anything. We expect about a 3%, you know, kind of a normal, th forecasters always say 3%, right? But we expect about 3% revenue growth, but it's already been called for, right? Because we've dedicated that to towards additional transportation and additional tax relief on the individual side. So we're really going to face a couple of years now. It's not a surprise that was the decision uh, back in the day is to, to dedicate for a couple of years revenue growth towards transportation. And so we're going to be facing flat available revenues at the general fund for a couple of years. <laughs> School aid fund is a different pot of money and sales tax, and so we're going to have a regular, regular growth in school aid fund. Uh, federal tax reform, 
the original request when, when someone called said, would you come and talk to us? They said, would you talk about federal tax reform? And I realized I didn't have a lot to say about federal tax reform. Uh, so that's why I changed the topic. But you know, the, Michigan's tax code, like so many other states, like almost all states, are tied to the definition of federal uh, taxable income or just a growth in income on the individual side. For a variety of reasons, we're kind of tied at the hip. Not always. There are always areas where we say we don't want to go where the feds do. But generally, when they change things, it automatically affects uh, our direct revenues. It affects us indirectly, obviously, if it has impact on corporate investment. We talk about that. You can tell me, where's Joel So He can tell me whether reduction, massive reduction in tax rates are going to increase corporate investment. So there's all these indirect impacts on the economy, but I'm just talking about direct impact on our budget. And it turns out it's really complicated. Uh, it took a team a month to go line by line by federal tax reform and then line it up with our tax reform. Uh, but it turns out we're going to get some revenue increase. The real impact was they kind of eliminated, I say kind of, we talk about that, but they kind of eliminated the personal exemption, which is a big part of Michigan's tax code. So unless we had done something, no one would take a personal exemption in Michigan, and that would increase revenues by one and a half billion dollars. Uh, no one wanted to do that because it was an unintentional impact. So we had this long debate about how we offset that. So we came back and, you know, after much debate, we increased the personal exemption, restored it. So there are all kinds of provisions. I don't think you want to get into the details, but if you're interested in the details of tax, um, the implications, I'll be happy to talk about it. But, you know, issues of loss, timing of loss, corporate loss recognition and expensing of some inventories, are all these things played in. And we thought in addition to the personal exemption, it would have raised individual income taxes by 60 million and corporate CIT, corporate income tax by 100 million. You know, if you've got to pay a tax, it's 100 million is a lot of money uh, if you're part of the, but generally, you know, we raised $38 billion a year, so it wasn't a big issue. And we think we offset most of that through our changes in the personal exemption. Uh, we can talk more broadly, you know, I can give you my opinion, but it's just my opinion about federal tax reform. Everybody has their own opinion, and I'm sure me, and some people in this room have studied it deeper. So we can talk about generally what we think about the economic impact of, of federal tax reform. Uh, but I just wanted to touch on the direct impact to Michigan. So let me talk a little bit, just at a high level, what everybody's talking about. Uh, the first is, at a high level, so just sustaining the progress we've made uh, over the last few years. It has been hard work. We've done it with a growing economy, so it, you know, obviously it helps to have the wind at your back. There's a lot of work that's been done. And so we need to do everything I've just talked about, both thinking about fiscal policy over a longer term than the next year, thinking about what happens during the next downturn. And, you know, just since this, I think this is part of a budgeting class, you know, there's just a couple rules of thumb that I've learned that make for good state and local budgets. Federal, it's a whole nother thing. But, you know, first is having a multi-year budget is absolutely critical. Absolutely critical, absolutely critical. Multi-year budget, force management to, f to focus on the longer term than just the next year. You know, some people, uh, you know, they always say, well, who knows what's going to happen, especially the longer term. Yeah, that's not the point. The point is the discussion. You know a forecast is going to be wrong. But it helps you focus on the implications of your decisions today, two or three years down the road. Uh, the second kind of rule of thumb, now, now I'm stretching out. You notice? I'm stretching out the time. The second rule of thumb is be very clear about one-time revenues and one-time expenditures. This is the most common mistake I've always seen in my career is that especially during economic expansion, you take a pot of money that really is one time, it's not gonna be there, and you build it into your base expenditures. And so what happens, you wake up in a couple of years and you found out you made commitments uh, that you can't meet. So have the discipline to understand what are one-time revenues and what are ongoing revenues. Spend the one-time revenues on one-time um, one spending. And that will really help you manage throughout the cycle. Uh, you know, a couple other things, you know, this diversity in revenue stream is really, really important for governments, state and local governments. Uh, we're not exactly meeting it as much as I would like. We talked about that at the state level and we talked about that local. So finding a diverse revenue source that can help manage throughout the cycle is important. And then the third, this constant focus as a policy person, you need to talk to the policy makers, the elected officials about this concept of intergenerational equity. 
It's just, it, it, is, it is so easy to either, uh, um, you know, kick the can down the road, or it's so easy to make short-term decisions that have short-term benefits and long-term uh, costs. And it, it, it's a million different areas. It's pension benefits. You know, if I, I have a problem today, I give additional pension benefits instead of wage and salary increases in a, in a local labor agreement. And then 10 years later, you find out you're underfunded. Uh, it's issuing debt, you know, issuing debt appropriately for, uh, for long-term assets. It's, it's, that meets our definition of intergenerational equity. But issuing debt for operating expenses doesn't make any sense. It sounds common sense, right? But it happens all the time. My favorite is we do these deficit elimination bonds in Michigan, which is issuing debt for operating purposes that was undertaken three years ago, even worse. So, you know, really focusing on, as a policymaker, helping elected officials understand this idea of intergener intergenerational equity. So th that's my budgeting advice. Focus on the multi-year budgets because it forces it. The other thing is understand capital because governments do a poor job of understanding their capital, both having maintenance versus new investments and understanding the shape of their capital. They just do a really poor job generally. Uh, and then... Um, uh, one-time revenues, one-time expenditures, intergenerational equity. That's the first bullet. The second, addressing long-term funding needs while maintaining a competitive investment tax system. You know, it's a really big debate we're having now. I, you know, I've, I've often found, and I've been in this area a long time, this idea should be taxes higher, should be taxes be lower. I, you know, I think, it's a, I think it's a wrong question. I think the question is, how do, we, com, how do we create a set of policies that increases standard of living for all Michiganians? So it's not taxes higher or lower, but it's, it's what are you getting for taxes? And so how do you mesh both the spending side and the tax side? And I think that's a much more interesting place to start. And practically what is happening now is we are having a debate about where do we want to selectively increase spending? Infrastructure is a big one, roads and sewers and water, um, and other infrastructure it gets, gets a little, you know, technology and all that kind of stuff. But infrastructure generally is a big area. People are talking about where do you invest and how. Education has always been a, a topic. How do we invest more in our educational system and get more outcome, more equity for the dollars we spend? Uh, economic development has always been a topic. Uh, we had a big debate last year about economic development incentives. That's a whole different debate. So, but anyway, this, this question now of where, where do we need to spend more and then how do we do it and maintain a competitive in uh, both a fair and effective, but a competitive tax system? So how do we balance those two things? How do we spend more while still maintaining some of the progress we made in the tax system? That's the second law, a big thing we're talking about. The third, we, I've already talked about, uh, this is more of a tax thing. You know, how, how do we keep, since we're so dependent on three main taxes, how do we make sure our tax continues to, our tax base and our tax system continues to evolve? as the economy evolves. And again, I've been struggling with this, this iCloud thing for, since I got back. You know, as, as transactions move from, you know, I go buy a book to, uh, you know, I go buy a disc that has a book to I do this thing in the cloud that I don't even know what it is. You know, we can't even define it. And as tax policy people, the minute we set it in statute, it changes. And so then we missed it all. So, you know, and, and I, as I said, it's one of our three pillars. So. You know, so much of my job is just pure math, right? We have a constitutional amendment. It's just simple math, simple arithmetic. We have a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. If we have a deterioration of one of our taxes, we either raise another tax, which is okay, or we cut spending, which is okay, but we can't do anything. We gotta pick one of those options. So as the sales tax continues to deteriorate, as a state, we need to come to grips with what do we do about that. Every state is dealing with that. Every state, every time I go to a conference, it's, that's a big topic. Uh, and then local governments. I've, I've, I kind of beat that to a pulp. That's really the topics we're talking about. This is uh, kind of the, oh, wait a minute, I gotta do it, sorry. This is kind of put in, you know, the way we put it together in a, in a uh, pamphlet. Talent, uh, we talked all about that. There's a big debate going on now, and it's interesting to find, because a few years ago the whole debate was, how do we get people into higher education to get a degree? Because, you know, as you all know, the economic, long-term economic earnings is increasing, but degree, not degree, how do you do it? It's focused, it's shifted now to, there's a lot of jobs that are available that are really great middle-class jobs that 
that have a good career, but we need to get people trained, whether, whatever the skill trade is. How do we get them trained? How do we get them interested? And then how do we match those with employers that need this? So this whole idea of talent has become a big thing. Education, you know, education is, we've talked about it forever. Here, here's, here's one little tidbit. It gets back to this pension issue. So we run the investment, uh, the pensions for teachers. Ten years ago, I looked it up, we were contributing $970 million, 2006, to the teacher's pension plan. This year, it's $3.5 billion. 970 to $3.5 billion. For a variety of reasons, I'm not saying we should stop that. I'm just saying if conditions were different, that's another $2 billion we could have put into the classroom. So anyway, people are talking about education, people are talking about infrastructure, people are talking about local government, and then effective government is where I spend a big part of my time. So, uh, you know, I, I'm done, right? I'm, I'm, I'm fired at the end of the year, by the way, which is, uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, and it, it, it's, time, I, it's time to let the next generation of policymakers handle these things and, and tackle these questions. I'm fine with that, and I, and I think they'll do fine. I think you'll do fine. What am I talking about? You're the next generation of policymakers. I think you'll do fine. I think, you know, just focus on the basic. Focus on the, pol the policy, not the politics. Take a longer-term view of what's required uh, and not just a short-term view. At least in Michigan, you know, and other states too, but at least in Michigan, build on some of the successes that we've had the last few years, kind of right-sizing the budget and the fiscal policy in Michigan. And that's where you guys can disagree with me. That's, that's good. But build on the successes we have. But take these challenges on. It's easy to punt on these challenges and take it and deal with it next year. But there's two problems with that. One is, is the problem always gets worse. You know, whatever the policy problem is, the longer you delay, it is always harder to solve. The hole gets bigger. The losers get more out, uh, uh, offset the winners. So the sooner you can take these issues on, the better it is, the easier it is to solve. And just as important as I started this talk today, we're at a real upswing in the economy, right? These are the best of all times. Unemployment rate's 4%, 4.5%. We should be addressing these issues now with the wind in our back. We shouldn't wait to the next crisis to try and address these issues. We need the will. We need the foresight. Uh, we need whatever it takes to address these issues while we still can and we have some flexibility. Now that's part of our job as the technical policy makers, technical policy, whatever we're called, to bring these issues to the attention. It's part of the actual people who vote. I don't vote, no one voted for me. But it's partly our responsibility to frame these questions so that it's easy for them to understand, it's easy for the general public to understand, and to take some of those harder decisions now because of the the greater good down the road. It's not easy, uh, but it's possible. Progress is made. It, like any large organization, especially governments, made to react slowly, uh, and that's that's most of the time is a good thing. But you can make progress in this area. And I, I don't know what you guys are going to do for your career, uh, but I, I think done right, public service is by far the most interesting career, most meaningful career you can do. I've done both. The private sector is great too. Um, you know, there's this, I am digressing, but there's this mischaracterization of both sides. You know, everybody in government thinks private sector is just as profit maximizing assholes, and that's not true. They are just concerned about the long term community because they know that's what impacts their bottom line. But the, and people in the private sector think people in government, you know, go home at three o'clock and, you know, they're, they're incompetent. Neither one of those characterizations are true. Uh, sometimes they're true, but generally they're not true. You can make a career on both sides, but don't, under, don't overlook government. I, th I think you can make a big difference. Uh, I'm almost done. So in what level of government? You know, I worked at CBO for a little while, and it's good because you're dealing with really big stuff. And you're really, really small fish in a really big pond, unless, they want, unless your first job is Secretary of Treasury. But generally, it's not gonna be that way. So in state government, you get your arms around issues. Now, sometimes you're dealing with issues you think, is this how I'm spending my day? Uh, but still, you get more of a direct impact on policy at, in state government. And local government is even more so. You know, politics becomes more personal the more local it is. And sometimes the hardest jobs are the school board and the road commission 
because they because there's much more ownership on the part of popula of the local constituents. So uh, let me just end by uh, I wandered a bit today. I apologize. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to hear criticisms too because you know I. I um, because that's what makes this thing interesting is criticisms. But what I really want to leave you with is if you have a desire to work in government, you should follow it. You should do it, whether it's federal, state, or local. It's not going to pay as much. You know, I pay, you know, you know all my responsibilities, I pay less than I paid my first year MBAs at uh, DT. But, but there, are other, there are other advantages to working in government. I hope you, I hope you pursue it, and if I can help, Come and talk to me afterwards. So that's all I have to say. I'm sorry if I took too long or too short. I was kind of making it up as I went along. So <laughs> now it's your turn. Thank you. So I was going to ask for uh, a projector and, you know, this, the, but some of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah. We used to, you know, handwrite on those slides and put it on a projector. We don't do that anymore. Uh, thank you very much. Um, again. Oh, thank you too. <laughs> Twice. I'm uh, I'm Stephanie Leiser. I teach the course that we're uh, hosting on budgeting and financial planning, and so now we're going to open it up for the Q and A portion. We've got Jason and Emily going around. I know you've seen them collecting the little white cards. So if you have questions you want to ask or things that come up. During the Q&A, please just uh, wave at them and they'll come get your card. And um, we have Stuart Hammond and Morgan Beeler, two of my other students who are going to ask the questions. So we will turn it over to them at this point. Great. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Call um, me Nick. Nick. All right. uh, my you know, my real title is Honorable, by the way. <laughs> All right. Honest to God, Honorable Nick Corey. If I could only get my wife, you know, I've tried for three years. She refuses to call me that. Right. Uh, my name is Stuart Hammond. I'm a first year Ford student. Hi, I'm oh. Morgan Beeler. I am also a first year MPP. And I'll be asking you the first question. Sure. So thanks for being here. My pleasure. Um, so the Citizens Research Council is pushing for local government services to be regionalized at the county level, with state revenue sharing going to counties for those services. From a state perspective, what do you think about these proposals? Uh, a couple things. I was on the board for Citizens Research Council forever. I love their motto. Their motto, and this was like 100 years old, the, the right to criticize government comes with the responsibility to know what the hell it is you're talking about. That's one of my favorite mottos. Uh, so this issue of local government, it, three, for the three years that I've been here, I've been pitching this story, and I haven't really gotten much traction yet. But I, I do think we need to take on the fiscal structure, the fiscal framework of local units of government in Michigan. We need to do it now in the economies. And I think it's in three buckets, and we ought to attack all three buckets. We need, I'm going to get to your, I got your question here, and we're going to get there in a minute, I promise. We need to tackle all three buckets. One is the unfunded liabilities we talked about because that continues to grow. Second is the efficient provision of services. Uh, we need to make sure we're doing it as, and again, locals always get upset. I'm not saying there hasn't been a lot of efficiencies over the last few years because of the reduction in revenues. There has been. We need to find other ways to continue to provide more efficient, more effective services to, to our constituents. I'll talk about that in a minute because that's where the CRC comes in. And then third, we've got to talk about do we have a stable revenue base? Um, that will support local governments, not give them all the money they want, but support governments over the cycle. So I've been trying to talk about all three areas at once. It's hard to t attack one without the other because all three are so interactive. You know, I I've had some success, but certainly not as much on all three. So CRC was talking about the middle one. Uh, how do you provide effective services? We have a disaggregated system. You know, let me give you a, a CRC used this as one of their examples too, is property taxes. It's our biggest revenue source, $14 billion. We do it in a more disaggregated way than almost any other state. We have 1,800 assessing local units of government. And at the same time, the system has become much more complex over the last few years for a variety of reasons. We're phasing out something called personal property tax, we have more credits, we have proposal. So there's a, and at the same time, all the high-level assessors are all retiring. We only have 145 top-level assessors in the entire state. 
for a variety of reasons, I'm trying to talk more and more about how do we do a better job of um, administering the local property tax. The easiest way, and this is where the CRC came in, is they said we'll just aggregate it at the county level. For years, people have said we don't even need townships, right? Yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, I, I have I have been in consolidation discussions for 30 years. You know, when I I was at a we had an educational task force a couple of months ago, and there were like 30 people and all these educators, and they said, we've got too many school districts, we need to consolidate school districts. I pointed out I was in the same room with a different cast of people and the same recommendation, consolidated school districts. Then we had 565, now we have 563. So after 20 years, we had a consolidation. So that this, you can, if you make a conceptual argument of we need to consolidate services at the county, that's fine. But you know, you you run into local control here. Michigan has a really strong, especially in the rural areas, local control, uh, and and rightly so. So the question is, and CRC kind of provided some of the services that they thought should be consolidated. The question is, how do you retain local control at the same time you get the economies of scale of um, many of the service provisions? So, you know, I'm a big fan of. Uh, consolidating areas without consolidating districts, so some functions are done at the aggregated level. You know, I don't think this idea of consolidation is a, you know, it's not a philosophical issue. Uh, just like outsourcing versus insourcing is not a philosophical issue. It's a practical issue day by day, sometimes case by case. Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. So the moral of the story is we are looking for ways for locals to jointly get together. Not necessarily, CRC went and said, well, the county should do all this stuff. I'm just saying there, is, there can be organizational uh, arrangements where we can get some of the economies of scale and still keep local control. You know, I'm a big fan of, uh, some people hate it, and I hate it sometimes, uh, but special assessment districts, where as long as locals, you know, the worst thing is, you know, I live in Plymouth Township, and Plymouth City has excess capacity in their sewer or water system, and Plymouth Township goes out and builds, and there's no co coordinated planning. You know, if we can force some kind of at least planning and then give them local taxing authority to fund that joint. I'm a fan of that, but you know, I've, I haven't made any progress and my clock's almost out, so that's you guys' job. So it's a long-winded way of saying some of the stuff uh, CRC talked about, everybody's been talking about forever and it's a great, good idea, but I'm less interested in what makes conceptual sense and more what we can make sense to move the ball forward that's actually we can implement. Just a long winner. All my answers won't be that long, I promise. So the next question, what are your thoughts on Michigan's municipalities courting big businesses like Amazon with huge tax break packages? Well, uh, you know, maybe I'm old fashioned. You know, you know, I really think, you know, I think the appropriate tax rate is zero, right? I think the appropriate tax rate is zero. I think we, we have taxes because we want to support services that we all decide. This idea of using the tax system to, you know, we're going to create a new industry, we're going to create a new business, we're going to attract somebody from here, I think is uh, a fool's errand. I, th I think the problem is for every dollar you give away, 70 cents is for behavior that would have happened anyway. And you don't know what's 70 cents is, you know, what the 30 cents is. And so that's the problem with using the tax system to do good things. You know, I view the tax system as a, a necessary mechanic, a mechanism to raise the dollars we want because we want to fund our spending. So I'm not a real fan of uh, tax incentives. Uh, having said that, we just p passed a big package last year that, you know, it became a joke. Well, the treasurer hates it, but let's pass it anyway. So, you know, you don't always win, and that's fine. No one voted for me, no one, you know, but, but I just think generally these big incentive packages are losers. And I know the academic literature always talks about, it always comes out as they're losers. But, uh, you know, Alan, Alan, Alan Blinder had this quote, uh, quip from a long, long time ago, and I saw it was in today's Wall Street Journal again, but I love it. You know, so politicians use academic research like drunks use a lamppost, more for support than illumination. I always like that quote, and it's absolutely true. So, you know, this academic research that says you shouldn't do it, you shouldn't do it, you shouldn't do it, has very little impact when there is a company on the line or a stadium on the line. That's a big thing. Who's going to lose the Red Wings? 
Uh, but, I, but I just think generally it's self-defeating. It, it's it's impossible, you know, not impossible, but it's difficult to avoid. It's difficult to resist. Um, but, and, you know, and, um, you know, I've seen elected officials, and it, it follows this pattern all the time. You come in and, you know, broad-based low rates, what you learn in Public Finance 101, and it's broad-based low rate, and, and then it gets, you know, they're missing out, and, you know, somebody announces they're going someplace else, and there always tends to be this, towards the end of a term, this idea that you really can incentivize uh, behavior. I mean, you can. The other thing about government, like everything else, is that uh, one of the problems with government is the, the benefits are so concentrated and transparent, and the costs are usually diverse, uh, dispersed in not as transparent. So, you know, if you're going to give a credit to somebody, they really like the credit, and you can really see the benefit of the credit. The cost, since we have a balanced budget amendment, somebody else's tax has got to go up or spending's got to go down. That's much harder to see. And so, you know, you can cut the ribbon. That's, that's pretty obvious. But it's hard to really reflect the costs of the overall policy. So that's why you tend to ratchet it up, because the other thing is the people who get the concentrated benefit, man, they're, they're going to really argue for that benefit. The people who pay the costs aren't as organized, because they don't know. So if you're going to get a dollar credit, you're really focused on getting a dollar credit. If you're going to pay a half a cent more, you know, who do you care? Right, so that's why you tend to ratchet up these things. So that's what I think. Other people think different things. The other way to do this job, by the way, I'm retiring at the end of the year. So no one can come to you and say, do what I want or you'll never work again. Because I can say, well, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> what am I going to do? All right, our next question comes from Twitter. What is the minimum amount of acceptable government or maximum amount depending on one's political proclivities? Wow. Well, first off, I don't do Twitter. So I don't even know, what, I, I don't even know who that's from. So the question is, what's the maximum minimum amount of government? That, you know, I don't even know how to start with that because so much of it is value judgment. You know, there is, you, you'll learn in public finance 101, I hope, is, is that we can talk about efficiencies, we can talk about the impact on the private economy and try and minimize the impact on the private economy because, you know, the assumption is efficiency and so you, uh, in the private economy. So you want to minimize the distortions of the economy. But that's not really the issue. The issue is always this value judgment. You know, it's not so much, you know, what do we think the impact is going to be. It's really, you know, this philosophical debate about the size of government. And that comes down to its beauty. It's in the eyes of the beholder. I mean, I think there, there is a real risk, especially because I always hear, well, let's let the experts decide this stuff. You know, come on. If this is a value judgment about the appropriate size of government, the experts have even less, you know, they can help frame the question maybe. They can talk a little bit about history, but they have less standing to talk about it than anyone else in the state. So I'm not answering that question. I, I don't know what it is. I mean, do, should government be bigger or smaller? I don't know. You decide. So there's a follow-up from the same Twitter question. Oh, do I get to not answer again? Go ahead. Um, possibly. <laughs> what is the right level of taxation or spending? Well, as I said, oh, a spending is a different thing. I was just going to say taxes. The right level of taxation is zero. I've already said that. The right tax rate is zero. The question is, you need to raise the revenues to spend what you want to spend. What's the right spend? And I can't, you can't really argue. I mean, people have talked about it should only be a percent of the economy. We have, actually have a constitutional amendment that says the size of the state government can't exceed a certain percent of personal income. That's really a blunt instrument, really. The question is, as I tried to say, it's not should taxes be higher or lower. It's do we have the right spending requirements and are we spending in the right areas? So it's not overall size of government. I don't find that as interesting as are we spending enough on education? Are we spending it in the right way? Do we need to spend more or less? That I can get my arms around. Are we spending the right amount on infrastructure? Have we underfunded infrastructure? A lot of our infrastructure in the state of Michigan was built in the 60s and 70s. Very little maintenance for a variety of reasons, or not enough maintenance. So I, I'm more comfortable talking about should we spend more on infrastructure or less? Should we spend more on education or less? I, I don't have a lot to say about is government too big or too small. Other people have a firm view about that, and it tends to be it's too big, it's too small. But I don't think that's really the meat of the, the argument. So there's a second question I didn't answer. Is there any third question you want me to not answer? (Laughter) 
Oh, now I've, now I've scared them off. They're afraid to ask because I'm going to be mean. How do you ensure that the state's investment portfolio is socially responsible? I don't. I don't. I don't give a shit. I mean, this is a really important point. I'm a sole fiduciary for a $75 billion pension plan. My sole responsibility, that's money is for retirees. My sole responsibility, you can tell I have passion about this, is risk adjusted rate of return. That's it. We need to do good things. We need to support blank. We need to restrict blank. We have all kinds of policy forms to do that and all kinds of ways to do that. We can pass laws to do that. The pension plan, don't believe this bullshit about, we'll restrict your choices, but you can still earn returns. That's a loser's game. Number one, because of slippery slope, and the number of treasurers that got thrown in jail because of what they did to their pensions is mm -hmm. remarkable. But more important, pensions are risk adjusted rate of return, that's it. And now I know it's gonna piss people off because people love to say, oh, we're gonna use our pension plan. We're not gonna invest in tobacco. You know, if you don't like tobacco, pass laws that restrict tobacco. If you don't like tobacco, tax the hell out of them. But pension investments, I have a sole responsibility, and that's retirees. My sole responsibility is risk adjusted rate of return. You can tell that's been a big debate. And by the way, our track record is not great. You know, we had a studio in Pontiac, some. <laughs> They spent 30 million with no collateral because we were going to uh, create a uh, film industry, and it went bust. Focus on the right things. You, we can do policy in many different areas, but not with our pension plan. You can tell I have some passion because not a, pe a lot of people agree with that. They think it's 75 billion. Boy, we can change the world. So, I, have I been hard on you? <laughs> Ask a question, I'll just agree with it. <laughs> well, you mentioned earlier a bit about infrastructure, so yeah. this is kind of a follow-up on that. Can you talk about how um, or if money is spent equitably for infrastructure projects in villages, townships, and cities across the state of Michigan? Probably not. Uh, what I will say is that we don't really know. It's amazing how little we know about the, the, the shape of our assets right now. Uh, you know, we don't do a good job of understanding maintenance from expansion of investments, so we don't know how much to spend to really maintain the assets we have. We don't really have a good idea of where we should make uh, improvements to the infrastructure. Um, so I think it's hard to say whether we're spending an equity or equitable or not, but certainly I think there are many cases where we've underspent in our infrastructure. Now, the legislature just passed a bill. Uh, that, that's a good bill. Uh, it's, they put it in Treasury, which I don't really like, but tr we're trying to get a statewide understanding of the shape of our infrastructure right now, and that's broadly defined. Uh, because, you know, again, it's, the private sector does it a little bit better, and part of it is budgeting. You know, in the private sector, there's an there's a, a, uh, accounting difference between capital investments and current expenses, and so you have this forced, more or less, to look at your capital budgets. Government is all mushed together. Uh, and so. I think we need to do a better job of understanding where uh, we need to invest. We need to invest in those right areas, and then we need to find a revenue source. Um, equity, again, is, uh, you know, there's this, always this trade-off, as I was trying to say, between local control, local input, and some of the economies of scale of providing better. So where you sit on that tends to be, you know, your position tends to be where you sit, right? If you're a local government with the local trans World Transportation Commission, the other thing, the way we distribute transportation dollars doesn't make any sense. Everybody knows it. No one wants to attack it because there's so many winners and losers. But, you know, we're giving away money to road commissions that, you know, have five people in there. So, so there is a lot of areas where we need to, have, we need to understand our infrastructure better. Uh, we need to make investments in the right spot. And then we need to right, see the right funding source. So I think this debate about infrastructure is one of the one or two top topics people are talking about in Lansing and across the country. And Washington, of course, is talking about it, and they're saying, you know, God love you, there's no money, but increase your infrastructure. So that one I agreed with. <laughs> Thank you. In your opinion, does the state's emergency manager law need any changes? And if so, what changes would you recommend, specifically in the context of the Flint water crisis? You know, I, I don't think we're going to get to it in eight months. Um, so that's something you can deal with. Uh, you know, I do think, uh, you know, emergency manager worked in a lot of areas, you know, a lot of areas that came in. But the problem was it reported to the treasurer 
and its focus was very narrow, which is how do we balance the budget. Remember, it was only put in when a district, there was a view that the district was about to fall off the cliff and file a bankruptcy. So how do you get in there and right size the budget? But to create a sustainable community is more than just right sizing the budget. And so the focus was, so, was too narrow. It did what it was supposed to do in most cases. It balanced the budget. But did it really create a sustainable community by improving both uh, human services and health services, but also uh, the growing economy within a, a local unit? So I do think uh, it, that if you're going to take this on, you need to expand it to have a broader scope. Now, that's a lot harder. I mean, it's easier to, to come in and raise revenues or sl slash expenditures and balance the budget. But, you know, this. You know, by the way, this balance, balance budget requirement is not just a technical legal requirement. This is getting back to this intergenerational equity. It is a commitment you have to make to make sure the next generation isn't paying for spending you're doing today. So this balanced budget idea is an important idea, not just a legal requirement. But having said that, the emergency manager, you know, focusing, you know, we're finance people, uh, you know, reporting to the treasurer. We're going to focus on finance, and I think it needs to be a broader idea. The other issue is, you know, it do, has all kinds of successes of balancing local budgets, but it, it's hard to create sustainability. I was on the Highland Park Review Committee in 1991, and, you know, it was, you know, the problems still are in Highland Park. So we balanced the budget in 1991, but we didn't solve the underlying structural problems, so it keeps repeating over and over again. Now. Some of the questions, some of the solutions are very difficult and deep-seated. I mean, some of these legacy costs, there is a small group of districts that are essentially insolvent, but no one's admitting it right now. And there's a small group of districts that's economic base deteriorated so much, it, it, you can't see how they can ever provide reasonable services to their constituents. So, you know, broadening this to create sustainable community is not an easy task. So that's a long-winded way of saying, it, it, we should all work on it as we should work on everything, and there are improvements that can be made. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on a flat versus graduated state income tax? You know, this is one of these areas where they are here once a year they come and say we need a progressive income tax and equity, and then it's never going to happen. I've, I, how many constitutional amendments have I worked on? I bet five. One has been successful, Proposal A, four of them have gone down. So I, I don't even address the question anymore. I, I say, one, we do have a progressive income tax, not as progressive on rate, but you know, we have deductions and exemptions. We you know, $40,000 is tax-free and pensions and all. So it is somewhat progressive in the sense of we've, the way we've set credits and deductions. But no one is ever in my lifetime going to change a flat rate in Michigan. So we can talk about the advantages and disadvantages all we want. I just don't have enough brain cells to focus on something that's never going to happen. So that, that's my standard answer. Thank you. Can you describe the effect of the federal bailout of GM and Chrysler? And how important was the bailout for the state in regard to revenue and jobs? Wow, that's a big question. I mean, that's a Hank Paulson kind of question. Uh, well, there, you know, there are two issues. It, it, they were embedded at the same time, which is the fa failing of the auto industry at the same time the financial markets were collapsing. So it's hard to pull those two things apart. You know, certainly you do things when you're in a financial crisis that normally you wouldn't do. Uh, and this is this whole issue of, you know, you got to stop the house from burning, even if you do things you wouldn't normally do or you think that are unjust, but the house is burning, you got to do it. So it's hard to dis disentangle those two things. And, and the things they did to, to support the financial system, you know, I, I, I was, um, I, you know, I, was, I had my own financial issues because I was responsible for the finance of DT Energy, which is a Fortune 300 company, and I saw firsthand the, the way the Wall Street froze and the impact on the rest of the economy, if it wasn't loosened up, would have been traumatic. So GM was all part of that, and Chrysler was all part of that. Uh, so if you, let's say, just take a theoretical exercise, if it wasn't the rest of the world going down, was it the right thing to do? Whew. I don't know. Certainly from a mission perspective, we can argue about the broader policy, about the role of government to bail out private corporations or for public corporations that fail. 
and there's all kinds of debate. So I, I'm not going to get into that debate. But for Michigan, clearly it was easy. It was a clear win for Michigan because the implication, you know, the cost would have been borne more heavily by the state of Michigan if, it, if we didn't do anything. The cost of the bailout are more borne by citizens across the country. So you can argue about moral hazard and you can argue about, you know, the role of capitalism and government. You can argue all that stuff, but I'm going to leave that aside. For Michigan, I'm glad they did it. Might not have been good policy nationally, but it certainly helped us restructure the auto industry. All right, it looks like we've got about time for two more questions. There better be good ones. All right, we're going to try here. In the context of the new pension OPEB reporting laws that were passed in December, yeah. um, when you talk about working with local governments and bringing their unfunded pensions into balance, what do you do if the elected officials just can't agree on how to do that? What type of enforcement authority does the Treasury have? Well, that was the whole debate. Uh, you know, we had recommended something with a little more teeth at the back end of it. You know, first you got to be transparent so everybody knows what the problem is. Second, you got to put together a plan that fixes it. If you can't do it, we will. And the we will part fell apart in the legislative process. Uh, you know, you know, democracy is a messy process. I think we made progress last year. At least a lot of people are talking about it now. There's more reporting and transparency, so we have a consistent analysis of what the problem is. And there's still local units are still required to put together a plan um, to so show long-term solvency of their pension and retiree health care. So we, there, there's progress there. Um, but at the end of the day, short of a financial emergency, there's not much we can do at this point. But you know the old cliche of something that can't go on forever won't. It's true in this pension area and health care area. As the obligations continue to climb, something will be done. It may be done in the next recession, it may be the wrong thing, but it, something will be done uh, just because of the necessity. At some point, if, they, if it takes 50% of expenditures just to service the retiree in health care, something's going to be done. So uh, the question is, what is the, the teeth? You know, we have, we can, we have moral suasion. And, um, you know, certainly if it turns into a financial emergency, we have abilities. But outside of that, you know, it's got to be taken unit by unit, contract by contract. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How do you view the relationship between the Snyder administration and the legislature, and how can you prevent the yo-yo in fiscal policy, as you call it? Uh, well, the relationship is, is fine. Uh, so how do you uh, present the yo-yo fiscal policy? You know, again, it's, it's what I tried to talk about. It's really as much as uh, providing the perspective and forcing long-term planning, forcing long-term forecasts, forcing multi-year budgets, forcing this debate between one-time revenues versus ongoing expenditures. So it's everything I just talked about. That's really how you, 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 you start thinking about this uh, fiscal policy over a longer term. And just a recognition that the next recession will happen. And everybody knows it. Nobody knows when, but it will happen. And how are we going to prepare ourselves to deal with some of that? Now, you know, you saw this rainy day fund went from zero to $900 million over the last few years. Uh, you know, that's kind of the indication. There, uh, back in 2010, 2014, 2010, 2012, and then a little bit last year, there were changes to the pension system that reduced that liability. We have an outstanding unfunded liability of the teachers' pension plan of about, and, and state employees, but teachers, about $50 billion. But we lopped off probably $20 billion of that with changes. So, you know, there are many areas where um, the fiscal house is in much better shape now, both this year and going forward. Uh, but as I said, there's still quite a few challenges to go. All right, looks like we can squeeze in a couple more. Okay. Um, so this is kind of a fun one. Good. Um, These have been fun. <laughs> what state are you least envious of? <laughs> oh, Illinois by far. <laughs> That's not a hard question. I mean, Illinois is a mess. It's a basket case. It is financially, whatever, insolvent is a better word than bankrupt because it's not so. And it's politically insolvent. I mean, Illinois by far is a mess. It's the biggest mess we have. 
uh, might be the eventually the first junk bond state, I think, ever, probably ever. So Illinois is, is, is the one we don't want. I think Michigan's the one we want. I mean, it's our home. It's a great place. So I'd say we're number one, Illinois is number 50. <laughs> and then you pick the, the rest in between. All right, and this will be our last question. You said that last time. <laughs> You're answering them quicker. OK. <laughs> this time we mean it. All right. What do you most wish the public better understood about your domain? About my domain? Hmm. hmm, hmm, hmm. Just, just that, like life, broad public policy issues are always trade-offs. They're never black and white. Anyone who says the answer is easy, it's X, either have a, has a really simple problem <coughs> or is selling you something. So you know, I, th I think, without really thinking about it, uh, I wish people understood that most of these difficult questions are balancing acts between two goods, and it's not good and bad. And, and, and whatever you choose, you have to understand the consequences, but you have to pick the best path. And, the, and, and then, you know, a corollary to that is the old, you know, as I get older, I live by cliches, that's my, but <laughs> the old cliche is don't let the best be an enemy of the better. That's also a really important part of public policy. You've got to make sure the ball is, you're moving the ball forward, but don't get so um, paralyzed by, you know, we, we, there's so much more we could do to at least take the next step because government is incremental and that's not a bad thing. Government change is incremental. It's, and, and so both of those things, that these, co these issues are complicated, there's no easy answer, it's black and white, so when you're making a decision, you need to understand and you need to be sympathetic to the people who are making the decision that they are facing trade-offs. And then, and then second, change doesn't come all at once. Uh, it's more incremental on the fiscal side. It's more incremental change, but that's okay as long as, you know, the tanker's moving down the Great Lakes and you can't move it all at once, but you kind of nudge it each time and eventually it turns around. Okay, so I know we've told you. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Turn it off. We are ready to be done. No, that's okay. Just scream right. it out. Well, as everyone knows, Twitter always has the last word. So uh, this question comes from Twitter. Over the last, over the past several decades, the states, including Michigan, have shed cost on higher education to the federal government. Has that been a good bet shed for the state of Michigan? On higher ed to the federal government. Okay, they are talking about what? What federal government costs at the federal at the, have they been picking up? I, I'm unclear. Unclear. That this is so have we? Uh, let's just change the question because this is what everybody, all the professors in the room want to know is how come we're not spending more state dollars on higher ed? That's probably what people want to know. This I don't know the federal government. They have a you know they have research dollars, but uh, traditionally in education, both K-12 and higher ed, you know, the feds are not as big of players. So. Uh, should we be spending more on higher ed? Yeah, yeah, yeah I guess it's a trade-off, yeah. I, I do think, by the way, this is unsolicited. This is not my area, so I'm always a little hesitant to talk about areas I don't know other than when I'm at the family dinner table. But you guys got a problem because the higher education is fundamentally changing over the next 10 years. And the, the way we provided higher education 10 years ago is going to completely look different than the next 10 years. This is virtual, virtual costs, whatever it is, higher education could be restructured. And more and more people are talking about we need to provide more money, but how do we provide more money? So part of, uh, you know, part of that is public sector, state support. Part of that is universities got to come to grips with that themselves. So there's two things. There's demographics, right? We're just on the baby boom and overall demographics. You see it in K-12 now. They're going down. And that's going to hit the universities. There is also this at least short-term backlash of maybe a, a university degree isn't the way to a middle class, maybe becoming a really good plumber is the way to middle class. And you have this whole technology that's providing a service in a completely different way. So I don't know what the answer is, and I don't know, uh, you know, I don't even know how it's gonna turn out, but this is gonna be fundamentally different in the next 10 years. So should the state contribute more? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, we have a weird constitutional provision in Michigan that says, depending on how you interpret it, give us some money and leave us alone. That's what our constitution says for higher ed. Give us some money, shut up, and leave us alone. And I, I don't know. I don't know. 
So is that how we're going to leave it on that? <laughs> I don't know if that's how I wanted to leave it. We don't have to leave it on that because we're going to have a, a little reception outside here. And I know that there are several questions that you guys passed up that we didn't uh, quite get a chance to get to, but um, you can perhaps <coughs> ask them in person. I want to thank everyone again for coming. And uh, please join us right out in the Great Hall. Thank you.